Hey, this is Benjamin Boyce attempting to pull off some uh, River Phoenix hair, uh, circa Russ Von Sant. Anyways, I have an interview of Stephen Elliott for you guys tonight, and he is a prolific writer and director and screenwriter and uh, ex-activist, and we talk about writing and screenwriting and ex-activism, and uh, we'll just dump you right into the conversation because he picks up right from what I just said. You can let me know what you want me to say about you. I was just going to say you're a filmmaker, author, and founder of Rumpus Literary Magazine. Yeah. Though, and biker I mean, you know, to Olympia. You know, the, rump, the Rumpus, uh, you know, I haven't been associated with that in almost two years. Oh, really? Mm. So you, just, you set it up and you got it running perfectly and you got bored? and. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. I mean, more... Uh, you know, it started losing money, and I was going to have to either hmm. uh, fire the managing editor or sell the magazine to her. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, if I – I didn't want to fire her because I don't like firing people, obviously. Hmm. And uh, I didn't really want to, um, you know, go back in full-time to running a web magazine, which is what I would have to do if I was going to make it viable, uh, sustainable. Yeah. And I, I – I don't have the kind of income that can bankroll a, uh, a magazine that's losing money. Yeah, you're not like uh, I, I, I started it on kind of a whim. I just kind of like built this website huh. and worked at it. But I didn't have any money, you know. And then for the first year and a half I was doing it, we just ran it by uh, doing events and raised money for it. Yeah. You know, so it was always a real, um, you know, a real loss leader. Well, I mean, no, it didn't. It didn't lose money. It couldn't lose money. I didn't have. I, I'm like, I, I'm. Not, I don't have money to lose. You know, it was just the <laughs> thing I was doing. And then it got to the point where I was making enough money to hire somebody to run it, while I went and did my other projects, wrote books and yeah. made movies and stuff. Um, and then it started losing money, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I had not been paying attention to it for a while, and so I just had to let it go. Yeah. You know. You're super prolific, though. You're always working. It seems like you've been working on something ever since you started working on things. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, you know, I don't have a job, right? So my whole job is just to kind of come up with projects and then try to make enough off of those projects to live. Uh, you know, recently I've been failing pretty badly at that, but I'm still, I'm still getting by. Yeah. You know, but it's just, you know, when I was younger, I was a, I was a small-time drug dealer, and so it's just kind of like. Well, like pills or like dime uh, bags? Yeah, just marijuana and acid primarily. Yeah. You know, freezer freezer drugs, you know? And um, <laughs> and I've always just been like that. You know, it's kind of... And, and maybe that's what being a writer is like also. It's kind of one small hustle at a time, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I hear you there. I, I mean, that's kind of what YouTube is. I mean, you know, mm. th three hustles a week, that's what I try to do. But, you know, oh. like 10 minute hustles or so, yeah. you know? And stuff. When you uh, when you were a small time dealer, was that in Chicago? I, yeah, I, I read you grew up mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yeah. And then uh, you did you move uh, to New York or to LA to to do your creative work, or did you start no, there? First, uh, well, I, you know, I I wasn't that directed. I wasn't that aware of what I wanted to do. Mm. You know, cool. um, as a history major in college. You know, as a group home kid, then I got to college and I didn't have any guidance, so I studied history and and I was always writing, but I didn't know that I wanted to be a writer. I yeah. just wrote all the time. Uh, huh. At some point, I broke up with my fiance at the time. I think I was like 25 or something, and I moved to a ski resort and I was a ski bum for a year. From there, I just kind of kept moving west because she had gone east. And so I ended up in San Francisco working in a youth hostel, huh. living in my car. And then that that lasted 15 years somehow. But really? it was really random. I mean, I just ran out of gas in San Francisco. I ran out of gas and money, got a job in the youth hostel. It was a dot-com moment. So I ended up getting hired. For, you get hired just walking down the street. Somebody heard <laughs> I was a poet, and so they started paying me to be a writer for a website. And then I did that for a while, and then I um, 
and then I went to work for Ralph Nader in the 2000 election. I got really political, and I traveled oh. around with him a lot, and then came back to San Francisco, where I got a Stegner Fellowship. So I ended up at Stanford for two years, uh, and then I started teaching creative writing after that was over, and I just stayed in San Francisco. Like, every time I wanted to leave, there was some reason to stay. No, huh. Like At one point, I got a ticket to New York, and I was going to go, and and then I fell in love, and that was another two years of my life, you know. Huh. And um, and then finally, in like 2012, I want to say, uh, 2013, I finally moved to New York, um, and I was there for a few years. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, I, I started making this web series, and I got really into like sequential content. Mm -hmm. And I decided I wanted to write for television. And so I moved out to Los Angeles because I thought, well, that's how you do that. Um, and here I am in Los Angeles. So I've not done anything for television. Well, right now you're working on a web series called Driven. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But that's self-funded. I mean, well, yeah. I've been getting people to fund episodes now because each episode costs about six or $700. Oh, okay. But it's very low, it's very low budget, you know. And you, you write them and... Do you have people help you get the talent and yeah, I mean, all that together? It's, it's not it's not hard finding good actors. You know, you just have to get them a good script, you know. Uh, so huh. um, actors are what I found working with actors. You know, I've made two feature films now in addition to the web series. And uh, they're uh, every actor I've ever met or worked with has been a real artist, you know, like. And by that, I don't mean they're good artists. I just mean they want to make something good. Yeah. They're like, and, and if they think something's good, if they like it, if they think you're an artist, you know, then nobody's going to talk them out of it. Yeah. They do it. And so it's kind of funny. Like, it, it ends up with like actors being like my favorite people. They're like this huh. group of people. I had no idea I would like them. I had no idea that I, w I would ever want to act myself. And it turns out that these are just like the real artists, you know, the people just kind of like, out there on the emotional edge, and I just like I just love them. Like, what do you like, what do you mean by that? Like, the real artist and being on the emotional edge. I mean, like actors, you know, actors put themselves out there uh, in a way of like making themselves vulnerable completely, you know, and like uh, like they just stand out there hmm. and they just get destroyed, you know, and abused, and they just do it again, you know, like. It's so, yeah, it's just that, it's just a desire to create something and, you know, put yourself out there in full and take those risks. I mean, you know, like a writer, you know, you put out a book every two years, you know, an actor does five, five editions in a day or something. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm just... It's just the emotional edge. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine doing it myself. It's yeah. just, it's, I'm so, I, I found that I was so impressed with them as a group. And, and there's, there's been, and of course, they're all different. They all have their different reasons for acting and, um, and different things they're trying to deal with that have pushed them towards acting. Uh, but yeah, as a group, I just find, I, I I've, I've very rarely worked with an actor and not come away just like really liking them and then, huh. you know, being just kind of... They make a connection with you then. Yeah, well, they bring out the best in me. You know what I mean? Like, really? I think that like you probably, you like people that bring out the best in you probably. When I'm around actors, I feel like paternal. Like I want to like coddle them and make them feel safe and like create this safe space where they they can't fail, where like... You know, like there's nothing, there's no way they can fail and then convince them of, the, of their safety and, uh, and then get these beautiful performances out of them because they feel safe and they can play and then give you things you didn't even know you wanted. And it's just a beautiful process. And I, I think the first time somebody reads something back to you and it's better than what you wrote, it's like, hmm. it's like, oh, that's love. That's what love is. You know, I mean, you just feel it. You know, it's the huh. most beautiful thing, and, and you know, you're 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 collaborating. You know, you're you're really collaborating with your with your actor, and it's just an incredible process. And I, there, I, I fell in love with it. You know, I didn't know I would. Is there a similarity between working with actors and being a creative writing teacher? Like, 
uh, no. evoking the best <laughs> from the, the student? No, I don't no. think so. I don't know if that's how it works. I'm not sure. I don't, you know, teaching writing is, is mysterious, hmm. I think. Um, nobody really knows how to do it or what the best thing is to do. Um, you know, you're not creating a performance together. Yeah. Um, it's somebody else's work. It's, it's really the writer's work. It's not, you know, writing, even though, you know, I was editing a magazine, not just I was editing the rumpus, but then I was editing, uh, I worked at Epic magazine for several years. Okay. And, um, and for a year and a half, I was a full-time editor at Epic magazine. And then for a year and a half, I was, um, you know, I was under contract part-time, um, kind of like a consulting contract, I guess. And, uh, but even though you're the editor and yeah, you're giving notes and you're working with them and everybody else is in the magazine is also involved in making this thing beautiful. Like a magazine is collaborative maybe, but the article itself is not like, it really is the author's article. Mm -hmm. You help them with it, but you don't put your name on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like when you direct a movie, the actors are given pretty close to equal credit. You know, I mean, like it's understood that like you're mm -hmm. all like like a great writer can write a great article with a terrible editor, you know, but a great director cannot make a great movie with a terrible writer, actor. Yeah. You know, no it's, way. It's kind of like a marriage, but like a polygamous or polyandrous marriage because there's so many oh. people involved. And then and the, all those people are necessary and they all have to be good. And if one and 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 the and it's only as good kind of as the weakest link, you know. So yeah. like the thing you can never correct in a movie is bad casting. Okay. You know, you, if you miscast something, you know, can't you can never fit. You can't fix that in the edit. There's nothing you can do. It's okay. just, you know, you're 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 doomed. You know. Hmm. Um. So yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful process, actually. Weirdly, I I, w I would love to do more of it. You know, then then I'm only able to do so much because, you know, when you're writing, you can just sit in your room and write a book, yeah, and not have to talk to anybody. But when you're when you're making movies and and even web shorts and web series, like you need a certain you need money, you know, and even like even when I'm doing them for like seven hundred dollars an episode, it's it's some, often more than I can afford in the moment. And I have to wait until I have the money, even though I have like a bunch more scripts ready to go. Oh, really? Yeah. What's we the difference? Episodes this, this month, actually, but they're both. Be, I, I found a funder for each for each of those episodes. And you have to work and figure out how to find the funding, which is a completely different part of the brain. Yeah, yeah, it's totally different. I'm I'm very good at getting people to work for very little money because I work for very little money. Yeah. Like we all kind of like do this project together and nobody really makes any money on it. And that was what the rumpus was founded on, you know? And, um, so, you know, like my last feature film I made for $10,000 wow. and, and that was, you know, a full feature length film. And, but I'm, but I'm very bad at getting paid myself. And I think, and I'm very bad at raising money, you know? And, uh, and I think that those two things are related. I think that, I think that, if I was better at making money, I'd be, would be not as good at getting people involved in my projects, you know, and, and, you know, mm. I, maybe, maybe it's just a matter of if I had money, I would be obligated to pay money to the people that I was working yeah. with yeah. or give me more money, you know, or generally. if you had a producer, you'd have to have another layer between you and the product and the actor and all that. Yeah. And I'm trying to get better at that, you know, cause I'm good at working with the actors. But I'm trying to get better at working with the suits, you know? Huh? which is not, not honestly my strongest, you know, skill set. What's but, the, what's the difference in your opinion, going from writing on a page to writing for the screen? Well, it is all those things, right? Where, you know, you run, you can create something beautiful on your own, but on the screen, you need everybody else, you know, making a movie or anything. is kind of like if you're the director and the director is really the author, it doesn't matter who wrote the screenplay, okay. but the director is actually the author. So if you write something and somebody else directs it, you're not the author of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and directing is kind of like pushing water. Or like, you know, remember those games with the marbles where you kind of like 
move the table and try to stop the marble from falling into the hole and guiding yeah. it down. That's what making a movie is like. You know, hmm. it's like you have very <laughs> imperfect control. You're just kind of guiding a thing towards its finish line and hoping that when you get there, you have a good enough material that you can work out something in the edit that makes sense. Okay. Um, so it's just like you have much less control. It's a lot more fun. It's, you know, there's, you know, the collaboration is, you know, such a joyous thing, you know, so. What's your take I mean, on editing? I mean, editing is, you know, is, you know, I, I do a lot of my own editing. I don't do all of it, um, but I edit a lot of my stuff. Or a lot of times I'll do like the first edit before the editor comes in, you know, if I'm able to convince somebody to do an edit. Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I usually don't have enough money to actually hire an editor on, on my projects. But there's a lot of people that also like being involved and they'll take a pass and they'll, t they'll do the edit, you know, hmm. which is great. Um, and, uh, you know, editing is like, I mean, it just depends. If I'm the person editing, it's very similar to the way I write. You just got the material and then you're you're trying to find the story in it hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and like but you've already got the once you've written you've got the clay and then you're, now you're editing so um yeah yeah i mean it's it's probably the part of the process it's most like writing you know if you're sitting alone in a room yeah you know taking things out putting them back in you know very linear but you're jumping yeah. around on the page but it's still very everything mm -hmm. has to flow into the next thing yeah you said you you work for Nader. Uh, I want to ask you about this uh, the current political environment, but that's interesting that you worked for the infamous third party candidate. What prompted yeah. you to, to go in that direction? I mean, at the time, you know, like you have to understand, um, I, I got very political, um, and the only thing that mattered then in two thousand. You know, prior to 9-11, the only thing that mattered was the prison, the prison population, you know, the prison industrial complex and um, hmm. and the incarceration of a generation, you know, of poor people and black people. And um, it was just the only thing that mattered. And, you know, the person that was most responsible for that was Clinton. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. you know, if you were really... Hmm. Uh, unforgivingly liberal at the time, you might have had a problem with Gore. Now, I say all of that, I'm I'm aware of the mistake that was made, <laughs> you know? In what respect? In, in, well, in leeching of, voters from Gore? Yeah, yeah. If Ralph Nader had not have won, Al Gore would have been president, and we would not have started an endless war hmm. with, you know, a third of the population of the planet that... Hmm. It's never going to be over. You know what I mean? Like, the Bush presidency was a disaster. I and as, agree. And as, as awful and corrupt as uh, Donald Trump is, he has not yet done the same amount of damage. He's more evil than George uh, W. Bush was. Yeah. He's, he's less competent, which is really a feat. <laughs> but um, but he, is not at, he is not yet... So he has lots of potential to do it, but he has not yet done the same amount of damage, you know. Yeah. So. I'm interested in, in your definition of evil, either politically or, or yeah, maybe so, moving up into philosophical so, land, but yeah, I would, on a you practical know, level. So, you know, I wrote a book on the presidential election in 2004 called Looking Forward to It, and I traveled with all the candidates. Hmm. And what I came to see at some point, you know, is certainly that... Um, you know, George W. Bush was not evil. Like, a lot of horrible things came out of his presidency. But he was, I don't think he was a bad person. Like, I think he believed the things he said. I think he definitely believed in compassionate conservatism. You know, like, he he believed that the things he was doing were, were better for everybody. Hmm. You know, he didn't think of himself as a racist um, at all. Uh, he was very serious about his Christianity. Uh, you know, so I would not call... I think I think evil, I, as a writer, when I, when I've done journalism and I've in, you know hung out with murderers and so forth and you know and in war zones and uh, evil is pretty hard to come by. What, most people are like part good, part bad. You know, like people that are only good are also very hard to come by. You yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. Well, like 
we all kind of fail and, you know, we all have our problems and we do dumb things. And, you know, that's why it's so tragic right now, how, you know, because because of the Internet and Twitter and everything, you, you say your one dumb thing. Yeah. Like, 10 years ago and you're going to get fi- you're getting fired 10 years later because, you, you know, you made yeah. a joke. It's now being taken out of context 10 years yeah. later because, you- because people are no longer, you know, the sum of their parts. They're that one. They're they're huh. only their one bad moment, you know. But anyway, uh, so, you know, I would say, like, George Bush was not evil, uh, but he was certainly incompetent. He was wrong about everything. Hmm. Uh, But Trump really, I think, really is evil. Trump is, like, maybe the definition of evil. You know, I don't – my sense of Trump, you know, and and whatever, who cares what I have to say about Donald Trump, but I don't think he has – I don't think he cares about anything. (laughs) You know what I mean? I don't think he has – I don't think he has any moral beliefs, you know. So it's so not. A, it's, it's not pure like, impulse, like, then. Yeah, it's like it's not. Yeah, you know, uh, it's pure. Um, you know, entitlement, I guess. Huh. You know, and narcissism, and um, you know, I don't. I don't think he actually, you know, cares about anything beyond his own personal gain and his own and his own. You know, he's he's just a strong man. He wants to be in in power and. I, you know, I don't. I, it'd be it'd be a lot different. You know, I would have a much different view of him if I thought he really believed in something. Like if I thought that Donald Trump was really interested in like making the world a better place, and we just disagreed about how to do that. You know, that would be an entirely different president we'd be talking about. I don't. I don't think that anybody thinks that of Donald Trump. Hmm. You know, I don't think anybody thinks that Donald and I and Donald Trump included that he is actively on a mission to make the world a better place. He's really just an expression of anger, hmm. mm-hmm. you know. So, but like I said, you know, I mean, everybody has an opinion of Donald Trump. I mean, who cares what I say about Donald Trump? You know, like it's hmm. we all we all have our opinions. You know, we all we all talk about him all the time, which is the thing he wants. Yeah, you know. So, um, you know, That's the game. whatever. Yeah. Have you have you tried to replicate in fiction evil hmm. or personify it or? Not in fiction. I don't. I don't think evil characters are very interesting. Yeah. You know, like. You know, like a TV show that I've been working on recently. I wrote a pilot recently. About a drug rehab, in the rehab Riviera, Riviera, which is, the uh, the part of California between Ojai and San Diego that's seen like a thousand percent increase, or more in for profit, uh, drug rehabilitation centers. Really. Okay. And this came about because of Obamacare mandating that uh, mandating that people uh, mandating insurance companies cover uh, rehabilitation. You know, so suddenly there was all this money. It was completely unregulated. It's still unregulated. Uh, people are fighting a lot. This, it's riddled with fraud and abuse. It's an incredibly messed up system. Really. Um, and, and everybody in there is a junkie because the people come in, they're junkies. The people that are working there are mostly former residents. And, and oftentimes, even the people that are running the place, like in one particular case that I, that I kind of put into my script where the, where the owner of the place is also an addict, you know. But that's also the place where you get sober. You know what I mean? So it's riddled. It's it's everything's messed up. There's all this lying and stealing and fraud, you know, and people are dying because think because their needs aren't being met. Yeah. But it's still there's still not an alternative. You know what I mean? It's it's still filled with good people. Yeah. Trying to help other people get sober, and there is maybe not any other place for these people to go to try to do that. You know, and so. That's what interests me. Those kind of situations always interest me in writing, you know, like situations mm. where things are messed up and there are no good guys and there are no bad guys. Yeah. But, but you know, uh, but the situation maybe like highlights certain tendencies, yeah. you know, and, and of course, power, money always corrupts. And it's pretty rare that money doesn't corrupt somebody, you know, money, is, money being power really in our society. Yeah. So... You know, so I'm fascinated by that. But I don't. I don't think that writing fiction about somebody who is actually evil would be very interesting for me. 
But do you I mean, think that the the system itself starts to manifest in your mind like a character? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. there's a character that you, you're calling the situation. I, I'm thinking about it as a system that's set up mm -hmm. that, that's uh, manifesting through the character's behavior. But in mm -hmm. the end, there's this uh, there's this influence or this broader um, thing that's exerting itself on the story. Do you, do you conceptualize it in that way about it or? Yeah. Definitely, you know, I mean, you, know, you have your situation and you have your story and the story is a journey, you know, the characters and the situation is, you know, they're in a, you're in a car surrounded by wild dogs, you know, and it, yeah. you've got Kuko, right? But then the journey happens and always happens internally, you know, and I mean, you know, in some of my earlier, in my, in like Happy Baby, which is my best novel, you know, the city of Chicago is clearly a character. Okay. And you know, I was a ward of the state and that book deals with the group homes quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. and what it's like to be in a group home as a kid when the state becomes your parents. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar thing, you know, like it's underfunded, it's rife with abuse, there's all these problems, the system is screwed up. And so you get, you get, we get angry at the system, but we don't always have a replacement for it. Mm -hmm. Like what was the alternative? Certainly going back to my father was not the alternative, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, you know, you say, okay, well, the, well, the drug rehabs are all messed up. Well, should we, should the junkies just go back to the to the streets and the and the and the shooting galleries? You know, like, yeah. no, I, we don't have like we look at these things and we say, well, they're messed up. But we don't have better places. We don't have replacements. And so we're, we often say we often try to we try to stop something that we think isn't working without having a, a replacement ready to go. And then and then everybody is loses. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's kind of like. That's how history moves, I guess. Do you think, do you think of yourself as a reformer or an activist, or were you at some point and decided not to? I was. I'm not. I would not. I'm not now. Um, but like, you know, I worked for Ralph Nader. Then in 2004, in addition to like writing, becoming a political journalist for several years, uh, I founded an organization called Operation Ohio, where we got all these authors to go to Ohio and do voter registration readings, okay. you know. Then I started uh, this thing called the uh, Progressive Reading Series. Oh, it's gonna... Sorry, uh, I, it's getting okay. dark. Uh, progressive Reading Series? Yeah, and you know, we would do these readings, we'd raise money for progressive congressional candidates. And then from that, I started a political action committee called LitPAC where I'd have readings all, and events all over the country, you wow. know, targeting to raise, to raise small amounts of money for ch people challenging in, in, in very conservative uh, districts, you know. And that led up to, you know, 2008, where everything changed, you know, and, and I put together an event in San Francisco that raised half a million dollars. And I'm, you know, when I did that, I was sharing a one-bedroom apartment with two other guys. You know what I mean? Like, I raised half a million dollars Wow. I'm living in a one bedroom apartment with two other people, you know, like I'm not, I don't, I didn't have any money myself, you know, like, but activism meant so much to me. And then I got, and then I kind of got out of national politics. And then I, uh, when the American apparel was opening, uh, I started an organization to stop the American apparel from opening in San Francisco, uh, on Valencia street and much limbo even did a segment about me, you know? So like I was deeply, deeply political. You know what I mean? It was like it was like politics was my life. Um, hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and now uh, I'm not, you know, I was I'm I'm less political than I've ever been. I'm I'm much uh, it's much easier for me to see the other side, it, it, which is funny because the other side has gotten so much worse. Right. Hmm. Like you look like, you know, you think like Trump and, and the far right and they're just they're much worse than the right has been at any point in my lifetime, you know. Hmm. But uh, but the left has gotten so intolerant as well. And it hmm. becomes harder, you know, like, I don't feel, like, I was, I did a lot of organizing, you know. I did a lot of events, and I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that now, you know. So, because of the climate or because of yeah, something inside of you? Yeah, I think partly because of the climate, I don't I don't feel that people on the left really want to hear my voice. You know, hmm. it's just kind of like, hey, shut up and listen. And I'm like, OK, well, I'm going to vote. You know, I'm going to vote for liberal candidates. 
because I'm a liberal, um, mm-hmm. cause I believe in health care, you know, for people, you know, I believe in, uh, I believe in, uh, national wages, you know, I believe in, in public utilities, uh, I'm against privatization, you know, hmm. but, uh, you know, I'm also, I'm also a big believer in free speech and due process, which the left has really abandoned as platforms, you know, hmm. um, but overall, yeah, you know, like, I'm always going to vote liberal. Uh, I just don't feel as involved, you know, or, or kind of as welcome in the process. And um, Was there so a yeah, moment that, that caused you to detach from activism, or did your interests just go to another place? No, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I have to think, I'd have to think about that long and hard. I mean, you know, it's not like I'm not still active, right? I mean, like, I make this web series and, and the web series often, the web series is about people living in a, in a, you know, post Trump electoral environment. I mean, that's really the foundational idea of the whole series, you know, people dealing with it in different ways. Um, so it's not like I'm not political and my art is still very political, you know, but yeah, I just can't see myself. I can't, I can't organize anymore. I think a big thing was certainly, uh, also, you know, I've been running these events, where we, you know, raise, raise all this money, um, you know, we'd raise a couple thousand dollars at a time. And then I did this event for Obama uh, in this rich guy's house in San Francisco, and I organized it. I got the writers. I put together the thing. It was the same thing I've been doing for years on an almost monthly basis. But this time, instead of raising $2,000, we raised half a million dollars. Wow. And because we were in, because we were in this person's house, yeah. And he had a different roller deck than the one that I had, you know? Yeah. And his event, you paid $500 to get in. In my event, you paid $10. And it kind of just turned me off. And I just thought, oh, it's just, you know, it's just good billionaires versus bad billionaires. And, of course, I want to vote and I want to register voters. But I didn't really want to participate in fundraising anymore after that. Interesting. Because the money I'm going to – I can't raise legit, – I cannot raise legitimate money in politics, you know? So, though, I mean, you know, even I say all of that, and I'm, but I'm, at the same time, I'm obsessed with what's going on with immigration in this country, you know, mm-hmm. and like, and the inhumanity of that, you know, and like, hmm. and, the, you know, children torn apart, apart from their parents and, you know. Um, Do you have a, a magic um, idea to solve the immigration problem? I don't. I don't know. The, I don't know. Is it another I, one of those systems that is just overall bad or do you think there's something uh inherently wrong with uh the way it's set up well i I mean i think the i think the like the racism and the hatred of immigrants that has been allowed to fester on the right and encouraged Hmm. is a real problem you know i don't know enough to say about the system say like well is ice the problem i don't know you know but uh, but people voting Republican because they hate people that are different from them. That's a a real problem. Having like having a political party that sanctions that way of thinking is is certainly a problem. Yeah. No, like, and I really, and so I'm against hate, you know, I'm I'm against all kinds of intolerance and hatred, you know, it's, it's just harder these days because I I feel there's a lot of, well, you know, just there's a lot of intolerance on the left also. and, And so I'm, I'm on the left myself, but I, I have a harder time connecting with people because I would, because the left is always talking about like we have to fight hate, but then they're so angry themselves, they're so also so full of hate, you know, that it becomes you know difficult. Uh, even though my aims generally line up with their aims, yeah, you know. Did so. you experience in your life? Because it seems like you had a hard, a difficult childhood. You had to deal with uh, Chicago raising you rather than parents. Did you have a? Right a moment in, in your life where you were filled with a lot of intolerance or hate and that you had to, I think I was, I think I was angry about my childhood, you know, um, you know, I was homeless for a year before the state to custody me. I slept on the streets for a year for all How of eighth grade. I was slept on the streets, wow. uh, 13, 13 to 14, you know, well, almost 14. Wow. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, and, you know, my father moved while I was sleeping on the streets, and that's why the state took custody of me, because they didn't know where my parents were. Hmm. And, uh, 
I was upset about that. I felt like I had been, you know, I got beat up a lot in the group homes, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, and, yeah. I, and a, lot of the, a lot of those homes, I was the only white kid. And, and I, I was kind of, I was, I had some bitterness toward that. I didn't, like, I felt like it wasn't fair that that, that had happened to me. You know what I mean? But, mm-hmm. uh, of course it was fair. It was perfectly fair that that happened. You know, like, it was, like I was not the only kid in there. You know what I mean? Like my story was not the only story, hmm. you know? So it's interesting as you tell that there's a smile on your face when you're, you're looking back at that. It, it seems like you're not really that filled with negative emotion about the difficulty of your childhood. I'm not any, I'm 46 years old. Right. So, huh. um, yeah, it's like when you look back on your younger self and you think like, Oh, I was so angry. It's just kind of funny. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, Oh, that's so adorable. I was so angry, you know, but I was angry for me. You know, I was, I was, I was so self, I was selfish, you know? Huh. And, uh, yeah, I feel, I feel pretty okay with all of that. Like, I think, th- I think that there was a lot of beautiful things that happened while I was in the group homes, you know? And I got out of the group homes and I went to college and eventually I got a, a, a fellowship to go to Stanford. So, you know, can I really, you know, who am I to complain? Huh. What, what kept you, uh, going in the face of adversity it, it, being beat up and, and being in a difficult situation it's a lot of luck really you know i don't know that anything kept me going you know i think i had like six suicide attempts that year really? you know like huh. so i mean the fact that i didn't succeed i mean when i got locked i got locked up for three months at one point because i came kind of close you know and then later in my mid-20s uh I, I you know i was shooting heroin and i had a massive heroin overdose and i was paralyzed for eight days you know really? like i i I didn't have to make it. You know what I mean? Like a lot of things kind of just worked out, you know, (laughs) (laughs) it wasn't like a, just a foregone conclusion, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one way of just being grateful then if you're a pure survivor, survivor, just based on statistical unlikelihood. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is, it is really that thing where like, that you know, in every situation, there's a certain amount of people that should make it that that don't, you know, and a people a certain number of people that shouldn't make it that do, you know. Um, I think you know when we're looking at this stuff. We can only really talk about percentages, you know. Like if you yeah. want to improve yeah. things, you can't look at a story of somebody made it because like the exception doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. You know, like you know, you got to say like, what's the percentages, you know. Like if you have a, one population where like a huge number a huge percentage of this population is ending up in jail. You're like, how do we change that, those percentages? You don't look at like the one guy that didn't end up in jail and then say, see, you know, you did it to yourself because that guy didn't end up in jail. So you didn't have to end up in jail either. You know, it's just, it's just, and, and, and it doesn't prove, you know, or people point to some not that should make it not making it as like some kind of like justification for a system. And it isn't, you know, because only the percentages are the only things that matter, hmm. you know, not the, not the individual stories, I think. Speaking of jail, have you been keeping tabs on the jail situation in the U.S.? Is that still a major point for you that you keep current on? It's still a huge, it's a huge problem, you know, and it still uh, it still disproportionately affects the poor and and the minorities, you know. And I think we've become society's become more aware of it, and there's there's been some movement, you know, mm-hmm. we've started decriminalizing some things, and it's really state by state. But we've also kind of, I, I think, lost sight of it because we've we've been thinking more about um, international issues than we, we when we were before. You know, George W. Bush got us into this war. Like people on the left were really focused on domestic issues in a way, and, and that was that was a much bigger domestic issue on the left than it is now. It's, it's still important to the left, but it just I think it's kind of overshadowed by. Um, mm by things like Roe v. Wade, I think people care more about than prison reform and, um, and you know, things like that, you know, um, more like they're, they care more about like how people are treated outside of prison. They do care than how they're treated inside of prison. And, um, and we think a lot more about, uh, you know, the effect of things internationally, you know, cause we're more aware of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, immigration and racism and stuff on the, you know, where, Obviously, like, prisons are like a racial issue, 
Hmm. But it seems like we're, we're, we're focused, we're focused on racism a lot, but somehow not as much on the prisons. And, you know, obviously like, you know, all these people that are in jail for drug charges, it's just, it's, it's insanity, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. yeah. What was Clinton's role in setting that in motion or ramping it up? Really, yeah, Clinton really ramped. He's the, he's he locked up everybody. You know, he in, increased the police forces, and um, he really. But he also like he was trying to you know he was trying to steal the issue from the Republicans. He's like they say they're tough on crime. I'm gonna be tougher on crime. Hmm. And so, a lot of the pro well a huge problem was they locked up so many people, which he's apologized for, and admitted that it was not a good idea. Um, hmm. But he also. Uh, codified you know what the republicans were doing so there was uh, so you end up in a situation where there was no opposition where everybody was trying to be tougher on crime than the other person you know and like hmm. everybody's trying to win the war on drugs you know yeah so instead of winning the war on rehabilitation you, yeah, yeah yeah stuff like that i mean you know obviously now we're just starting to like legalize marijuana this it's crazy when you think about it, like you can walk into a store and buy pot in California, and there are still people, like lots of people, in jail for marijuana. Oh, yeah. You know, all over the country. That's, you think about it, it's amazing, you know, that it can be legal in one state, and somebody else is doing 10 years in jail, you know? Yeah, yeah. It happens. Yeah. What was your... I, you said that you overdosed with heroin, so you've had a relationship yeah. with really heavy drugs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did you go through rehab, and was that self-imposed, or did you get help with that? Uh-uh. I've gotten, you know, I've gotten a, fair, a certain amount of help, you know, with, with drug addiction, uh, with drug issues. Um, you know, it's, I, I find that, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's hard to get help with those things. You kind of got to, you kind of got if you don't look for it, you won't, you probably won't find it, you right. know, but it's certainly, it's at the same time, it's there if you, if you want it, you know, and there's a lot of people out there that would, that will help you if you're looking for it, you know. Was dealing with the addiction like a mindset um, or a, a habitual uh, so, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff is a daily practice, you know. So it's that that, you know, when when you're talking about like about using, you know, that's you just you go back to that every day, you know, and just you try to make it through, and you just you mm-hmm. try not to use that day, and that's all you can really focus on, you know. Hmm. Hmm. That's fascinating. That it, I mean, I agree, and I've gone through that too, and I, I deal with that too. Um, but it's just interesting that it's it, it narrows the the scope of your livelihood just to the now like like when you have an addiction that you're getting over it really makes you focus on the present and then eventually start being able to project into the future perhaps mm-hmm. but it, it's an interesting kind of uh the way that it orients you probably even neurobiologically yeah yeah so and you were just writing just cause you didn't have any uh, big grand ambitions to just be a infinite writer. Yeah, no, I didn't. You know, I was writing. I just started writing really young when I was like nine. I started what, writing fiction? poetry, poetry, poetry. Yeah. And then in college, I started writing short stories, but I was writing like a lot of poetry and the poetry were, the poems were becoming longer and more narrative, you know, and they're, yeah. so they were becoming these micro stories and then and they kind of transitioned into short stories and then the stories transitioned into novels, and then you know, and then at some point, the novel, the fiction became nonfiction, and I started writing essays and memoir and hmm. so forth, you know. But yeah, I never, I never was like, oh, I want to be a writer. I never mm-hmm. thought there was any way that I was going to make a living as a writer. That just seemed ridiculous. You know? <laughs> and has uh, your early work on language with poetry? Is there like a poetic thread that runs through? all of your writing are you really concerned with the the physics of language i think that i'm a sentence person you know i get real deep into the sentences i'm kind of a compulsive editor and i'm i mess around a lot at the sentence level you know kind of like gilding you know what i mean and putting up the sconces and you know like you know like filing down words and finding rhythm between sentences like I get I get really deeply into that and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to do that less you know I'm trying to I'd like to because I, w- I would like to write for television and I would like to just like be oh, okay. like be better at plots and I'm yeah but I'm always thinking about language you know ultimately so but you know like 
ideally you don't really notice it. Like if you're really paying attention to language, at least for me, I don't really want to draw attention. Like when I, when I'm massaging the language, it's, it's so you don't notice it, you mm-hmm. know, more mm-hmm. than anything else, you know, mm-hmm. well, if you notice it, then it's like, it's probably too flowery for my taste. But there's still a rhythmic aspect to it. Yeah. But I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want you to notice that while you were reading it. Okay. All right. <laughs> so it's like, like a, a, a flow. You, yeah. But not really a musicality to it. You're not interested in, in having a musical, a musical layer of the there story. There is musicality to it. It's just like, you just don't want to draw attention to mm-hmm. it, you know, mm-hmm. but there is like nice writing has a, has a, has rhythm to it. Where should yeah. the attention, where should the writer try to keep the attention at then, if not at, at the level of the sentence? Every, every writer is different, you know? I mean, it depends, yeah. like, if you're, um, if, if you're a literary writer, then you're writing, by definition, you're writing character-driven fiction, mm-hmm. you know, uh, or character-driven nonfiction, even. Um, but if you're a genre writing, then the plot is more important than the character, hmm. right? So... That's kind of the divide. So it kind of depends what kind of writer you are. Hmm. You know? And if you're an amazing genre writer, you like are able to write something where the plot is more important than the characters, but still have amazing characters. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty pretty rare. Pretty rare. But it yeah. happens. You know, and among the best it happens. You know. And you're aiming you're aiming for plot then. You're you're aiming to to focus more on that with your process. I'd like to be, I'd like to be better at plot than I am, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean my process changes all the time. Mm. I just throw it to the wall and, you know, just sit down and write and try to figure out what the next thing is, you know, huh. talk are to people, get story, interview people, get stories, you know. Yeah. But, are you, do you have a novel in the works now as long as well as this web series or are you doing mostly the web series? Like, I'm like halfway through a novel. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know that I'll finish it. Uh, hmm. I've got, you know, I've, I've written a feature length script this past year and also an, and two pilot two uh tv show pilots no oh. so i've been kind of focusing on that you know and then i make my web series you know and those are only like seven to ten pa- or seven to twelve pages i guess each episode how long does it take to produce each uh each web uh series episode you know i, mean, I always shoot them in a day oh. you know i generally it takes about a day to write one and that takes a day to shoot you know, and then it takes, you know, a week or two to edit, you know, and then you got to, there's some organizing, you got to get everybody in the same place, you know, and so forth. Uh, they don't take that long, though. Huh. You know, and I'm trying to make them so they take even less, because what I'm doing now is I want every episode of the web series from this point forward to only be, uh, you know, one actor, you know, two actors, one location. I just want to, like, so that there's kind of neat little plays, you huh. know. Have you yeah. played with the stage at all, or you you can have, bypass wrote, that with? I wrote a play, but I I, I don't want to, I don't want to direct it. So maybe somebody will direct it one day. Hmm. Yeah, but it won't be me. Why not? It, what's different between a play and a I movie? I don't know. Practice, I, don't, I, don't I, don't any, I don't know anything about theater. I don't, I don't have any desire to write direct a play. You know, it doesn't. I don't I don't know why one thing grabs me and the other thing doesn't. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. You know, yeah. I wish, I wish I, this is the funniest thing, actually. Think about like, you know, our current like national discourse and um, mm-hmm. and how, uh, you know, the quickest way to be wrong about anything is to think you know somebody's motivation, hmm. right? Like you did this because and you tell somebody why they did something, and now you're for sure going to be fighting because they're going to say, "No, I didn't. I did it because of this." You know, and I often don't know my own my, my own motivations. You know, I think I'll oh, probably for, I think for this or like, but if I'm really being honest. I'm like, mm, I'm not really sure why I feel drawn to this and not to that. You know, like, you know, if I really start unpacking, I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe ask me tomorrow. You know, maybe tomorrow I'll feel like directing a play. Huh. You know, but I <laughs> but I, I do try to um, I respect inspiration. When I feel inspired, I try to run with it. And not question it, because inspiration itself is such a gift, you know. Mm, mm-hmm. What What happens when you don't have that? Do you get really angry or? Sad? I get really depressed, you know, because I'm sitting yeah. around and I don't have anything to do, you know. If it would, without inspiration, I don't know what life is, you know. Huh. It's boring, and and I can't get any work done, and like I don't feel like I'm moving in any direction, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be working on. It's really uh, 
a sad state of affairs when it happens. That's why I'm so, when I get inspired, I'm so happy that inspiration has arrived, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I don't fight it, you know? Yeah. I, I feel in, in my own life, uh, I've, I, when I don't have that inspiration, I try to find something to put and plug in there and different mm -hmm. substances and people have come <laughs> to take the place of that. But yeah, it's only when I have inspiration that that falls away because I become pure action rather than wanting or, or needing something external to me. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Thanks for letting me chat with you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We know how it goes. Yeah, I will. I'm going to, I'm going to post this up and I'll link to your, uh, to your web series. I I'm having problems with Vimeo. So I only got through one episode because I kept on doing that loading mm -hmm. bar thing and you can't oh. really, I can't punch my computer. I can't afford to do that. So, <laughs> but it, well, good luck with it. It's fun, engaging stuff. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Have a good evening. Thanks, All right, bye.